the title of this is Life-Giving Group Services in Nursing Homes. And what I ultimately want to do is to share with you principles for preparing and sharing life-giving messages that engage the residents in the nursing home in worship, in prayer, and in Bible learning. I believe and I have seen that you can engage residents even who have dementia, and it's very possible to do that. There's some aspects of technique and some aspects of just understanding principles. But I want to say what I'm going to share today is not rocket science. It's quite simple. It is mostly going to be affirmation for those of you who have been involved already. But it will also hopefully provide a couple tips and ideas and maybe some challenges to check some of the approaches that, that you're using. And so I, I just want to mention that. And then, so I'm going to do a screen share here so that you can see my PowerPoint. And what I want to say is that this handbook here, Nursing Home Ministry, Where Hidden Treasures Are Found, uh, it has significantly more information than what I can share today. I actually wish I had the ability to make this training program two parts because there's so much more that could be shared. But today I'm going to touch on a number of things that I think will be helpful. If you don't have this book, Nursing Home Ministry, Where Hidden Treasures Are Found, I would highly encourage you to get it. And as with everything in our store, everything is suggested donation. And if for some reason you truly can't afford something, please do let us know and we will work with you on getting a copy of it. So with that, can we take a minute to pray, to pray with you? Our Father in heaven, we just thank you for the living word of God that lives in every one of us who belong to you and how you want us to share your love and your word in the care homes. And Lord, with all the information I might share today, we know that without you, we can do nothing. And so Jesus, we've gathered in your name. We welcome you and we just praise you and thank you that you've given us the privilege and the opportunity to minister to the residents who live in these care homes. Lord, let your word reach them in such a way that they can grow in the grace and the knowledge of Jesus, that they might be saved, that they might find hope and peace and life in you. Lord Jesus, may your kingdom come and your will be done in every senior care home and that the Father would be glorified by what you do in and through us. We ask this, Jesus, in your holy name. Amen. Amen. Now, each of you should have an outline that looks like this. We email that to you, and that way you'll be able to follow along. If there is something that is yellow and underlined, you probably want to write that in the outline. That's why it's yellow and underlined. All right? All right. So I want to begin by just sharing that there are various approaches to providing Bible-based group services. Pretty obvious here, but I wanted to just set the stage. We have worship services, hymn sings, Bible studies, devotionals. What I like to call the group services we provide is a Bible fellowship hour. It defines what it is. We have fellowship. We have the Bible. The one thing I would highly recommend is that you do not call it something with a denominational name in it, because if it's ABC Presbyterian Church, it may discourage some people from participating in. So our group services have the goal, and, and this is the thing, we have to think of what are we doing? Why are we doing it? And so I set some goals for us as a team, and we have the goal of facilitating meetings between our friends and Jesus. Jesus told us that when we gather in his name, he would gather with us. And so we are bringing our friends together so that they can be in this meeting with Jesus. The thought that he is actually in the room with us is so powerful and so important. And so we have to ask ourselves, in what ways can we facilitate a meeting between our friends and Jesus? So what we do is we gather in Jesus' name to share 
in his love to share in singing worshipful songs of praise and gratitude, to share in focused prayer, to share in the learning of his word as it relates to the residents' needs. And we're careful that we're not just trying to give Bible information. The cognitive level of many of the people in our group services is limited. And so the more information we give them, the less they may retain. And so we really want to stay focused on what is it that's relevant to them and what are they dealing with today? And we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. So in our meetings, we pre and it's so powerful. Think of the power that, that God's word has when he's present to us as we're sharing in these meetings. Because in our meetings, we're presenting the words of Jesus and his apostles, and we're encouraging our audience to take Jesus's hand in humble surrender. When the person who's listening to our message takes Jesus's hand in humble surrender, then, then amazing miracles take place in their lives. It's so powerful. It's so wonderful what he does when we speak his word in love. Through God's word, we can point our friends to Jesus. And that's what we're doing. We're pointing the audience to the Lord Jesus. Anytime we speak of what he says, we're saying to them, basically, stop looking at what you're looking at and turn over here and look at Jesus. When he is lifted up, people are drawn to him. And so the focus is not so much topics, although we will have topical messages. It's not so much even the stories, although we will have stories and testimonies and parables, but it ultimately needs to go to Jesus. And as we do that, the residents will see him, and then in humble surrender, we will show them how they can take his hand. It's a beautiful thing. So I want to talk about five primary spiritual needs that the residents have. Very simply, now, if we are able to help them with these five needs, then the other needs, well, let me say this. There are more than five spiritual needs, of course, of a resident, of people, even ourselves. But if these five spiritual needs are met, then the other ones seem to have a, a way of getting solved and fulfilled. So let me share very quickly, and again, these are in the book and other training programs where we expand on them. But the first spiritual need I want to point out is the residents need caring friendships with people who know and follow Jesus. We may think, well, a caring friendship, is that a spiritual need? Jesus gave us the greatest commands to love God and to love one another because he knows that we have a great need to be loved and to love and caring friendships that are in both directions, that not only I'm caring for you, but they are caring for me. When they grow in these kind of friendships, it is meeting a significant spiritual need. Another spiritual need is faith in the words and the name of Jesus. And to be able to embrace his word or call upon his name in faith is not only for salvation from earth to heaven, but it's for salvation from any spiritual issue that we're struggling with, whether it be unforgiveness or fear or anxiety or, or any kind of thing that we're harassed by darkness. Faith in the words and the name of Jesus is such an essential component and, and gift and treasure. The other is hope. We need to help our friends learn how to hope in the faithfulness of Jesus. It's not hope in the things I want as much as in the faithfulness of Jesus. If he said it, it's true. And so to help people learn how to trust Jesus and the hope in him and his faithfulness. Next is the peace of Jesus. There is a peace that surpasses understanding that can guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. And there are things that can rob us of that peace. We can be a born-again follower of Jesus and lose our peace. And so we like to focus on the things that not only give us peace in Jesus, that uh, allow us to have that peace, but also the things that would rob us of it. 
because unforgiveness is, for instance, is one. Not trusting Jesus is another. But there are other things that would rob us of that peace. And he wants us to know that so that we can not let our hearts be troubled. And finally, genuine purpose. I am convinced that the residents in nursing homes are not there because their doctor kept them alive or their medication or somebody just stuck them there. Although it may feel like that and seem like that. Jesus has a purpose for us in this world. And I want to help them to know that. And if they are able to understand what their purpose is, then they will live a more fulfilled life and find more contentment and satisfaction in the difficult journey that they're on. So those are the five primary spiritual needs that I have in my mind as I'm preparing my messages and wanting to address at least one of these. Now, one of the things that we have put together over the years is this book called God Cares for You. It addresses these primary emotional and spiritual needs of seniors in nursing homes. It actually covers a little bit more because we talk a lot about heaven. And I'll, I'll, I'll highlight this book a little bit more in the future. But just know that this was written specifically to give you understanding what scripture says about these spiritual needs. And it's also in giant print and spiral bounds so that you can share it with residents so that they would be able to read it and gain understanding in these areas from a biblical Christ-centered perspective. So now I, I want to talk a little bit more about our goals. I like to ask, what is the ultimate responsibility of the church? So whether we realize it or not, when we go into the home, and we're providing group services, we we are, for many, we are the church for them. And so if, if we understand that, no, you may not be a pastor, and you may be intimidated by that idea, but you are pastoring them, you are shepherding them. And if we understand what our ultimate responsibility is, then we can help our residents more effectively. And so I want to say that the ultimate responsibility is to help people grow closer to Jesus. Simply put, whatever programs we have, whatever approaches we take, whatever, if we we sing a lot or sing less or do this or do, it's ultimately, am I helping my friends grow closer to Jesus? And I think we all know this as believers, but this cannot be done without prayer. It's impossible. And we cannot lead a person to a place that we ourselves have not been. And this is so huge to understand that we're taking people closer to Jesus because we ourselves are growing closer to Jesus. And that's why I put in this scripture, John 15, 1 through 17. This is not only, and it's not the only verse that I would like to highlight, but it is one that if we, if we, Embrace John 15 and what Jesus is telling us about the true vine and the branches and how essential it is we have to be connected to him. There is no scripture probably that's greater for us as ministers of the word of God to understand that. Well, let me just read in verse 5 through 8. Jesus says this, I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains, or some translation abides, the man abides in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Think about the nothing. I can go prepare my message. I can get my commentary out and write all these great notes and come in and give this amazing information to the people. And if Christ Jesus is not present in that room, then what am I doing? But he said, when we gather in his name, and if we're abiding in him, look what it says. If anyone does not remain in me, he's like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. Verse seven, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given you. This is to my father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Friends, if Christ is present, and if we welcome him in our meetings, 
and we look to him for the message that he wants us to give, even in this webinar here, I've given some of this teaching perhaps a hundred times, literally. I stop and I pray, Lord, what do you want me to share? And I invite him to reign over everything that we do. And if we do that, then we have the confidence that he is with us. And if he is with us, we can help people come where he is. I trust everybody knows that, but it's just so important that we recognize this. When we look at our ultimate responsibility and to help people grow closer to Jesus, we want to be able to bring them where we ourselves have been. I want to talk a little bit now about the function of the, the service and then putting the message together. But gathering our friends for the service, a lot of times uh, we have groups that the staff or the are the ones who bring all the residents out. I really like to show up 30 to 45 minutes early and help the staff bring the residents out, work with them. The staff will get new people that you never met. Sometimes they'll invite people who won't want to come because they just don't feel like going or whatever. But if you go and you invite them, they may come because you're their friend. And be willing to spend a minute to greet your friend before you invite them. I like to say to them, hey, how are you doing today? And when I do that, it gives them a minute to know that I actually care about them. I'm not just getting them to do another thing. So greet them and take a minute with them. I, I like to tell them, it's written on your paper, would you like to come to the Bible Fellowship? We, we sing some old hymns and talk a lot about Jesus. Would you like to do that? A lot of them really appreciate knowing what they're being asked to do and having the choice to say yes or no. And that's why this next point, don't pressure them to go. Just if they say no, just say, well, that's okay. Maybe next time. I have learned that when I give them that choice, I'm giving them respect and, and they so appreciate it. Now, they may not go, but what we have found so often is after I invite them, they will, if they say no, perhaps five minutes later or a few minutes later, one of the other team members are going down the hall and they see them. They don't even know that I invited this person, but they invite that person also. And often will they say, yes, I'll go because they've been respected and they know that if they, they're going into an environment where they are loved and they're also going to hear what God is saying today through his word. And finally, when you get the people into the room, you want to position the people who are hearing impaired near your speakers. I, I like to save that spot for after you get to know them, you know that Mrs. Jones cannot hear too well. And so I try to find out what's her good ear, and I put her close to one of the speakers. And speaking of speakers, I want to really emphasize the value and the power of having a quality sound system. In the handbook, we have a section on page 76 that explains a lot of detail about how to use a sound system and the value of it. Now, we don't give you information where and, and how, you know, what sound system to purchase because that's changing all the time. If you don't have one, I, the first place I would encourage you is ask the person who runs sound for your church and, and see if you can get some help with that. There are some things in the handbook, though, that speak of what your, what, what you actually want in this sound system so that when you talk to this sound person, you can say, these are the four things that it needs to be able to do. And it will help you a lot. If your residents are falling asleep, if they're not paying attention and you have to yell for them to hear, that's a good sign that you need a good sound system. Amen. So I want to talk to you about preparing, I like to say a relevant Bible lesson. It's not just a Bible lesson, but it's relevant to the needs of the residents. And so we're always looking at what are the, the spiritual needs. And so I like to say on your paper, your message should address one of the audience's emotional or spiritual needs and how Jesus loves them and how he can fulfill that need. So I, I like to write out the verses that I'm going to use on a page. And I want to give you a sample of this. Right now, we are going through the Gospel of John at one of the, or two of the homes I'm in. 
So here we're in chapter six. I put a little title here. Almost always the title has the name of Jesus in it. And so here's here's some scriptures that we're we're sharing out of John. And then down here are some related verses and then a prayer. Now, this one page overview of what we're going to share allows you to engage the residents. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. I, I have on the top of this PowerPoint slide, use a minimum of 16 point bold font. I like to use Arial, and that seems to be one that is very easy to read. And you can see we put our logo here because we'd like them to know about it. But uh, you want to include your closing prayer on the bottom. And again, I'll address this in a couple minutes. One of the things we've been doing over the last couple years is we've been putting a word puzzle on the back. And on this word puzzle, I like to put a little note, kind of a greeting or a closing point that is often it's related to the message that we have given that day. So I'll show you more about this in a couple minutes. So in preparing a message, it's, it's a lot easier to organize yourself if you understand the four primary parts of a Bible lesson. And so that's what I want to address now. What are the four parts of a Bible lesson? First is the introduction. And in the introduction, we're, we're sharing an issue, a concern, something that's not okay, and it's before Jesus appears on the scene. And we talk a little bit about how does this situation relate to us today? There has to be relevancy so that the residents can say, he's talking to me, he's talking about me, or she's talking about me. So two, the second part is the actual Bible lesson. And this is the part where Jesus intervenes and in the situation that we talked about in the introduction. So we, we answer a couple questions. Number one, why did Jesus intervene? Did somebody pray? Did somebody call upon him? Was somebody already with him? And because they were with him, he was present. Then we try to answer the question, what does Jesus say or do about the issue or concern? What, what kind of command or directive or promise does he give in this situation? The third part is what I call the application. How does this relate? to the way Jesus leads and blesses people today. There has to be a relevant application to what's happening. We can, we can use, let me give you an example. So in John 6, Jesus is with this huge crowd of people. There's at least 5,000 men and a bunch of women and children, and there's no food and they're famished. And so this kid shows up with his lunch and he has five loaves of bread and two small fish. And he gives them to Jesus. Jesus gives thanks to the Father for them and then miraculously multiplies that, that he was able to feed his disciples. He worked through his disciples to feed every one of those people. They had enough to eat and then there was some left over. And we can look at that and we can say, wow, that was really an amazing story. But it doesn't really have any relevancy for us today until we start looking at what does this mean for me? And I'm sure all of us have thought through this uh, portion of scripture, but what it's saying here is that Jesus can do great things through our little if we give what we are and what we have to him. And if we love our audience and love the people that's before us and ask him to use us or use what we have to help them, he will do much more than we can ever think or imagine because that's the way he works. So it's great if we can include an illustration to demonstrate how this lesson applies to us. You can mention something that happened in your own life or someone else's life. It's great to have another story that's related to it. That's a real life, this happened in our lifetime kind of story. Then also to include one or two additional scriptures that strengthen your main point. Now, this would not necessarily be the 12 verses that you found when you were looking in your concordance, but one or two verses that will highlight this and, and affirm the truth in this. These, this is a huge part of affirming the application for us today. I'm really careful to 
to think what it must be like to sit in a wheelchair where somebody who has the capacity to walk into the building, give the message, and then walk out and go live in the world that I wish that I was in. And I try to be very sensitive. What does this sound like to the guy sitting in the chair? When I say we should be active, we should be active in our faith and do what we can. A person could be sit, sitting there thinking, I have so many problems, I don't know what to do, and I feel condemned listening to this message. Now, sometimes that's not our fault, but I just want to be sensitive to sensitive to it. The other thing that I'm really careful about is that my messages are never turn or burn kind of messages. And I know that maybe most of us here would know better than that, but some of us have come from a background that it's all about getting somebody to accept Jesus so that they can avoid hell. I get that. I know that I don't want them to, to perish either. But I rather tell them, instead of turn or burn kind of messages, I rather tell them turn because you are loved and you were created for an eternal relationship with a God who wants to be with you. But sin separates you. And so we're turning from sin because light and darkness cannot be together. And he loves you so much that he has sent Jesus to remove that sin from your life. And if you would just hope in him and trust in him and call upon him and open your heart to him, he will give you life and you can be with him forever. And instead of, look, you sinners, you better turn or you're going to be in big trouble. And I, I again, I know that most of us know better, but I have heard those kind of messages. And sometimes when that is brought out, you're condemning your audience, and that's not for us to do. I trust that all makes sense. Now, finally, the last part of a message is the decision, the call for a decision, and, the, and prayer. It's a call to faith to take Jesus's hand for grace and to trust and obey him. So when I pray, it's like, I'm reaching out my hand to Jesus and I'm saying, I heard what you said through this word. I want what you're saying. I want you and I want to walk with you and to take his hand and trust him and ask him for the strength, the grace, the ability to do what he said. This is a place of receiving Jesus's promises, his commands, his help, his directives. It's so wonderful to watch the residents do this to take his hand. I, well, I'll show you in a couple of minutes how that works. There's actually a way to, to bring that about, but I don't want to get ahead of myself. So what I want to do now is to move into an example of a group service. Now, I want to say this, that this is going to be an example of how I do services. And there are many ways that a group service could be brought out. Uh, methods are not as important as the principles. And what I hope that you're gaining today are principles so that the services are done with forethought and, and goals that are, that are in keeping with what allows us to bear much fruit. So let me just share uh, a couple things that have that, that the components, if you will, to the group services that we share at the homes that we're in. Now, I'm in a, a skilled care nursing home. I'm also in an assisted living. I do one-on-one -on -one visits in other homes, but these are the two places that I do group services. And they are quite different than each other. I, it's an interesting difference, which we can maybe talk about on another time. But so the methods are sometimes different. But generally speaking, the first thing I want to say is we need to pray with our team before we get started. Friends, again, we can do nothing without Jesus. And so we need to invite him and welcome him to be part of this gathering and ask him to lead us. I, I've seen even myself where I'm so busy and so frazzled by all that's going on that day. I run into the home and I'm not even prepared because I haven't prayed. Now, I might have a message. I might have my Bible paper and things like that, but I haven't prayed. And if I haven't prayed, I'm not ready. 
Second is we want to include some worshipful background music while the residents are gathering. Sometimes it's totally silent and people are gathering and they might sit there for 15, 20, even more minutes with no background music. You can help them enter into worship even before you get started. Of course, we give a friendly welcome and you might want to recognize some new people that have come, maybe the birthday or anniversary or something special. Oh, Joe, I see you're back from the hospital. We've been praying for you. It's good to see you. Things like that. And then, of course, we want to pray with the residents. After the prayer, we like to sing a, a few songs. We use the Sunshine Songbooks, and I, I, I want to highlight these. Some of you may not know about these books, but they're called the Sunshine Songbooks because the Sunshine Society created them many years ago. And uh, now, since they have dissolved, God Cares has these songbooks. And these are giant print. They have a lot of the old hymns. You can see, here's a favorite, of course, in the garden. And so here's the first verse, and then the chorus is highlighted with a, a border around it so that as we're singing, we can always come back to the chorus. But the fact that these are giant print allows many of the residents to see the words and sing along. They're also spiral bound so that a person doesn't have to use two hands to hold the book. We have a, another copy that's the same. It follows the same pages and it has the piano chords and the guitar chords so that a person could lead the worship. I personally cannot sing. My singing voice is for me and Jesus. And outside of that, everyone else kind of wishes that I would be singing far away. But the, the great part about this is that there are also CDs, four CDs that go with this book particularly. There's two books, this one, there's four CDs that go with it. And it has the music, and it has the, the words singing it. And so if you are like me, I will introduce the song and say to them, we're going to sing page number eight in the garden. And when they get there, the, the music's already playing. And then when they start singing the words, I turn my microphone off and I sing with them. And it, it works really well. It's a very helpful way. I've been doing it for many, many years and it works quite well. So you want to make sure that your music Whatever you're using for the residents is on a it's it's a slower pace and on a lower key. That is so important that it's a slower pace and a lower key for the residents to be able to keep up. So now after about four songs or so, I like to transition into the message. What I will do, because my messages are a little bit longer than probably some people would want to do, I will at the second to the last or the last song, just before we sing it, I will give a preface to the message and kind of a cliffhanger, you know, say to them, so there was this event that took place where Jesus did this amazing miracle that, that helped thousands of people all at once. And he wants us to know today how we can participate in something he's doing in this world. And I want to tell you a lot about that. But first, we're going to sing another song. And so it's a cliffhanger, if you will, and it allows me to get some of the preface out of the way so that when the message starts, it's a lot more direct. We're, we're getting started with the beginning, if you will. Don't have to do a lot of preface, if that makes sense. But anyway, so we collect the song books and pass out the scripture sheets that I use. We have found that if you try to give them the scripture sheets while they're holding the song books, it's just too much for some of them to handle. So we try to collect the song books. And then, of course, we're playing some music while that's happening. So uh, the message, I wanted to remind us of a verse in John 12, 21. I used to write this on the top of my paper when I spoke to different audiences, not only in a nursing home, but when I was speaking in churches and that. I love this verse because it helps me get my focus properly. In John 12, 21, it says here, well, it, it says in verse 20, Now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the fest. Verse 21, they came to Philip, who was from Bethesda in Galilee, with a request. Sir, 
they said, we would like to see Jesus. And so I would write on a little post-it, sir, we would like to see Jesus. And it helps me to make sure that I know that these people are not here because of me, but because they long for what only Jesus can give them. And it just sort of works to adjust my focus, if that makes sense. So we also want to make sure we're speaking loudly, slowly, and clearly enough to be heard and understood. Sometimes we think that they can follow us, but the faster we run, the harder it is for people to digest stuff. It's really good to take pauses and allow in that pause time for somebody to really absorb what's being said. Because if we're rapid fire, it's just too much for some people. I think it goes without saying, but I, I try to make sure that I am speaking with a voice of loving kindness. And I, I like to say, love your audience. There might be some people in there that are a challenge. Love your audience, whether it's a one person or 50 people, whatever the group is. Ask yourself, I'm getting ready to say this. Am I doing this as a love to them or, am I, or what else might I be doing this for? And I'll tell you, when we go and we love our audience, if that's one of our primary desires and goals, we get over ourselves a lot faster because we get worried about what people might think and how my message sounds and how good am I and all that. But if I'm loving my audience, even though I'm a little bit choppy and clunky, I'm loving these people. And I want to tell you, sometimes they hear that louder than the message that you share. In fact, we've all heard it. I, I don't remember what you said because I heard what you were like. <laughs> People don't know, or what do they say? People don't care what you know until they know that you care. So things like that help me to remember that I must be intentional to love my audience. And so when the message is over, we pray. And so the, the part about the prayer, and this is how we can help residents take the hand of Jesus. In fact, this all started when I thought, in my church, they have an altar call. How do you have an altar call in a nursing home environment? So if you said, oh, we're going to have an altar call, how are you going to get all these wheelchairs to wheel up to the front? And so we decided, let's make an altar call where the people are. And so we have put the prayer on the bottom of the page. And here, let me show you an example. So here's a sheet. On the bottom of the page is a prayer that's related to the message that we gave. And so we always, this is how I do it. I'll say, I hope this message was helpful for you. And, and would you like to pray? Or was this message helpful for you? How would you like to pray and ask Jesus to help us to live this out? And you know, some are nodding and some are kind of quiet. And then I say, well, there's a prayer on the bottom of your paper. And I'd like to read it for you before we pray it. And if it's a good prayer, we'll all pray it together. So let me read it first. And I read it very slow. I read it. Our Father in heaven, I do not have much to give, but what I do have, I give it all to you. Lord, take my heart and my life. Use me to bless others. I ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, my Lord. And then I will look at the audience and I'll say, is that a good prayer? Would you like to pray this with me? And there's a lot of heads nodding. And I say, all right, let's all pray this out loud together. And so we pray it together. The same way I just read it, we pray it nice and slow. The wonderful part about this is that the residents that you think maybe were not paying attention, maybe some who are nodding out or just kind of zoning out, at, at least it looks like, you watch their lips moving. And as you're praying this prayer, you're looking over there and you see that they too are praying this prayer with you. And the ones that don't pray it, those are the ones that I try to spend a little bit of extra time with one-on-one -on -one and just see where they are. Some people are quiet. They don't think they have the right to pray out loud because they've been in an environment where that's only the ministers did that. And so we, we try to encourage them to be active in their faith 
by asking Jesus with their own lips for the help that we need or the, or to help them humbly open their heart or surrender to him. Of course, after the prayer, we we say goodbye to them and we uh, and I'll talk to you a little bit more about that, but this is sort of the end of the service at this time and maybe we would sing a song. Some people like to have the Lord's prayer interspersed somewhere in here. We do that occasionally. And so uh, this gives you a general idea of how we do this. Now, uh, I want to talk a little bit about engaging your audience. It's so important that you always announce what you're going to do before you do it. In other words, let's say at the beginning of the service, I welcome people and now we're going to pray. And so I like to involve other people on the team and so I'll say, hey, and John is going to come up and lead us in a word of prayer for our beginning. So, John, would you come up and lead us in a word of prayer? And John comes up and he looks at everyone. He says, hello. And he says, well, I'm going to pray. So let's bow our hearts before the Lord and, and pray. And so uh, announcing what we're going to do on a couple of occasions here, at least four or five times here, has allowed the audience to get what's going on. The hardest thing is when you're in the middle of a prayer and somebody who can't hear is sitting back there saying, what's he saying? And and you, right in the middle of the prayer, or they start talking to one another because they don't even know that you're praying because you haven't made it clear. It's the same way when we're encouraging people to turn to a certain page on on the in the hymnal. If you announce the page, this is how we do it. And now we're going to turn to page number eight in the garden. That's page number eight in the garden. Now, if you're looking at your audience and they're just sitting there staring at you, you haven't made it clear. But if they're all bending over and trying to find the page and you know that you, you made it clear. So it's very important that we make that announcement clear and concise. In the midst of the message, I, I find that if we invite our audience to read a verse or two out loud, and not the whole page, some people may want to read the whole page, but I try to get them to read at least some very important verses that will be meaningful to them. I invite them to answer simple questions. I don't ask them questions like, why do you think Jesus came to this world? Or something like that, where the answer could be some people will take over your service and you don't want to rudely interrupt them. So they may take five minutes to answer that question. And the answer may not even be close to what you think is appropriate. So the questions that we ask are usually yes or no answers, or of course, or something like that. I like to ask them about words. Jesus said he will give us rest for our soul. What does the word will mean? And people will stop and think about that that word will and and the answers to that those kind of questions are very simple i encourage them to repeat a phrase or an important word and this is very helpful for engaging them finally if this doesn't happen for me often but occasionally if i just can't keep them awake that day i may take a song break and I might say, this, this verse is so good, and it reminds me of this song. And, and I would take a break and sing that song with them. It wakes them up. Songs wake people up. So, <laughs> All right. So these are just some of the things that we have found that have really helped to engage the audience. You should have almost none of your residents falling asleep. Now, some are they come in, I think they come into the service to sleep, but most of them will stay awake. I also do a little a couple things. I'll walk around a little bit. Standing stiff behind the podium does not help. There's something with movement and, and just excitement in your message. And I know in the beginning, if you're just getting started, it's kind of hard to be excited because you're worried about yourself. But in time, it really makes a difference if you can do that. So page five on your outline, before you leave the, the home, and when the message is over, rather, I do my best to sh greet and shake hands with every resident that's in that room. And if I'm shaking hands with a couple people in the front row and I can see people heading out the back door, I try my best 
to get back there and say goodbye to them and thank them for coming. You want to leave the meeting room in order. We are a witness before the staff. And if we put things back even better than what we found them, it will make a huge difference and be a testimony to the staff. And so finally, I have this statement that's already written on your page that the church service or Bible study that you share in a nursing home may be quite different than the one you have at your church. However, it should be of no lesser quality. So you're not trying to copy what your church does. You're trying to follow these principles to help people take Jesus's hand to grow closer to him. What we like to do is occasionally get together and talk to one another and ask ourselves, how effective are we? What can we do to make it more effective? And maybe it's to add an extra 10 minutes of fellowship time or cut back on some of the service time and, and spend more time with them. There are different things in fact, our last newsletter, we had a, a testimony from a team leader who, who did this and have found he has found a significant increase in uh, effectiveness. So I have on the bottom there too, we're not perfect, but we always strive to do our best. Amen? I want to share a couple resources with you, and I want to take you on a little bit of a tour of our website so that you have all the resources that we have available to you. The first thing I want to talk about is the scripture handouts. Throughout the pandemic, we created these so that the residents could get these. The activity directors have been downloading them and sharing them with residents. And we just, just today, we got such a wonderful testimony from an activity director who said, they're using these handouts and the residents just love them and the staff is so encouraged by them. But now that the pandemic has shifted, a lot of the volunteers are using these handouts for their Bible lessons. So these are more topical. The, the, the handout that I showed you earlier was from the Gospel of John and a lot of those are based on a story or an event. But these are a little bit more topical. The principles still apply for preparing your message. So what you'll see in these handouts is a, a title, Why Did Jesus Come to Us? And then a preface. This is a very important question. The following verses give some of the answers, and the prayer opens the way to receive this gift. And so here you'll find four, five, six maybe verses that relate to why Jesus came to us. And then on the bottom of the page, again, there's a prayer which I, this can be shared the same as the other example that I gave with the, from the Gospel of John. And again, these have the word puzzles. Some of them we use a crossword puzzle. And you can see here a little note that says the answers for this crossword puzzle are found in the text on the front page. So what we're trying to do is as they're trying to find the answer here, they're reading scripture again. And we love doing that for them. So next, I want to highlight once again the God Cares for You book. It was designed so that you can find scriptures and examples and illustrations that you can share also in your visitation or services that you provide. So living with change, everything changes, but Jesus does not change. He remains the same. And so that's what chapter one covers. Chapter two, again, hoping in Jesus and not in things that are temporary or un not guaranteed. Chapter three is where we invite them to open their hearts and surrender their lives to Jesus, inviting Jesus in. We actually have a page in that book where they can sign their name and, and date to say that they actually prayed the prayer to invite Jesus into their life. Forever Friends is about relationships with people, loving our neighbor as ourselves. Chapter five is about peace, that Jesus gives peace. It's a promise that he gives us rest for our soul. But again, there are what we call peace thieves. And we, we go into some dialogue on what robs us of peace and how we can come back to Christ and have his peace. Chapter six speaks of our purpose, that we are all created as believers in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God has prepared in advance for us to do. So this is this is highlighted in chapter six. And then finally, chapter seven, amazing grace in heaven. We talk about what is heaven, what we have to look forward to. This increases the hope and the anticipation 
of the future of these people who know that the inevitable is looming at their back door. They have watched many residents leave that facility because they have passed on. And so we want to give them hope for that. And also, we have a curriculum that we developed. It's 21 lessons that's based on the God Cares for You book. The curriculum was written in such a way that it not only provides relevant lessons for the residents, but it also helps the user develop skills for giving their own lessons. So the style that we have, which is what I've shared earlier with the four primary components to a message, we use that approach and it's highlighted in these in this curriculum so that the user would develop skills in sharing their messages. So I want to share our website here. This is a, a sample of our website. And what I want to show you is under this tab here, resources, this is where you'll find the large print scripture handouts. And you can see there's a whole list. There's actually 52 of them uh, listed here. And they're in English and they're also in Spanish. And then we also on some of these, and we hope to do more, there are videos of that's that could be used if you're not a speaker and you would prefer to use a video, you can introduce the topic to a residence, show the video and give them the handout. And all you have to do is click this and it'll give you a Word doc. And the nice part about it, let me just show you one real quick one. Here on the bottom, now none of this is editable except for on the bottom here, you can edit this part here. So we, put kind of a generic greeting there, but you can put your own, the name of your team or your ministry name and uh, write a blessing or a thought for your, your friends. So that's something that you could use. Going back to the resources, we have a video library where there are some other training videos. There are some inspirational ones, a little bit of help for recruiting if you want to present your ministry to maybe a home group or a Sunday school group, or even your church if they allow. So there's some videos there. And there's also under training, you see Zoom connections. This is probably how you signed up for this session. But on the bottom here, we have uh, a previous uh, video called one-to-one -one visitation. This training here is so helpful for enhancing your group ministry. If you are not getting an audience in your group services, start visiting one-on-one -on -one and building relationships. And this video will help you with that. It comes with an outline. And uh, we plan on, if this video turns out well today, we will be adding this group ministry video as well. Going back to resources, we have greeting cards for residents. If you want to send a birthday card, these have nice giant print scriptures in them. We have, again, Bible lesson videos. We have coloring pages with uh, word scrambles on the back so that there's a little bit of fun for them. But everything we publish has scripture in it and, and an encouragement for the folks to look to Jesus. That's one of the things. Now, finally, I want to show you the store. In here, we have all the things that we do for training. We have books, we have videos, online, DVD. However, we have uh, CDs and DVDs. These are all under the training. We have devotionals and lesson plans. These three here, Strength and Peace, Hope and Help, Onward and Upward, were books that the Sunshine Society developed. These two particularly have lesson plans. And so these are worth taking a look at because they might be helpful too, in addition to some of this other stuff I've already showed you. We have a giant print Bible. We just would like to highlight that here. This is, has a 16 point font and it's bold. It's, it's made for residents to be able to read. And so we have that available. We have other scripture portions, the Gospel of John, the epistles, these are Proverbs and Psalms, different ones. Now, this here, just in, in case this matters to you, this Bible is New Living Translation. These ones here are either King James or the New King James. I personally like 
the NIV or the ESV and some of the other translations, because I think the residents can understand it better. And uh, that's, it's more important that they understand than we follow tradition, in my opinion. Anyway, here's a song books. You have the, the words only, the piano leader copy, and then the CDs that are available. There's another set of song books called Heavenly Sunshine. Again, these were all created by the Sunshine Society, and they're excellent. Let me go back and see if there's anything else. We have tracts that the Sunshine Society developed. We have crosses that could be given. This is a huge thing during Easter time when people want to highlight the cross of Jesus. There's a nice poem that goes with that. It's a great little gift. So you can see in the store, there's just a number of items that, that are helpful. And I, I won't neglect to mention that we are a ministry and we do have a donation page we do a lot of stuff to make sure this is very secure. If you ever sense that the Lord would have you help us financially, we would be honored by that and grateful. Now, on the front of the website, you'll always see four blocks. This one here was for training. This will come down after today because this is the last day for this group. The God Cares for You, we're offering a gift, a free copy of this if you've never had one. And so there's some instruction for that. Here's an interview we had with Focus on the Family. Here's some uh, opportunity to get active in prayer with us. We have a monthly prayer Zoom meeting. So these are four things that we have highlighted right now. Some other videos that are out there. But you'll always see these are changing because we're bringing in things for you to serve your needs. And finally, the last thing I would like to point out on this is our newsletter. We do have it here on the website as a PDF. You can download it. It's simple. Just hit the button, and there's our latest newsletter, and you can read through that. If you want to look at some of the past ones, we have a couple years' worth on here, and so those are available to you. You can sign up here. It's real simple. Just give your information, and you can get either a paper copy that comes through the U.S. mail or the electric electronic copy through email. So I think that's it. And I, I just want to encourage you that the newsletter, it's it's not just a fundraising newsletter. This is to encourage, inspire, inform, instruct you in matters related to this nursing home mission field. And yes, we do encourage people to donate. So I don't want to surprise you on that, but it's something that we invite everyone to do. Well, friends, it's been good to share with you, and I hope this has been helpful. Before we leave this session, though, may I pray for you. Our Father in heaven, thank you so much for the grace that you give us to know you and to walk with you through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Thank you also for the great privilege it is to serve you in this mission field. We love you and we thank you that you love the residents and you have given us the opportunity to shine your light in their lives. Lord God, may your kingdom come and your will be done in us and through us. And may there be no resident without a friend to point them to you, Lord Jesus, that they may take your hand and find life, hope, and peace in you. We ask this all, Jesus, in your name, and for our Father's glory. Amen. Amen. Thanks for taking the time to be with me today. Remember that God Cares Ministry is here to serve you as you serve the residents in the senior care homes. Just give us a call or reach out to us through our website. May God bless your day. Mm -hmm.